Thanks for joining me on today's 172nd Air Wing video. We have for review a Code 3. So please don't scour your catalogs wondering if you've missed a release because this one is a custom job. So to define things a little bit, uh, Code 3 is in reference to a, a U.S. Air Force military designation for uh, maintenance brevity codes. So when the uh, pilots comes back from a mission, if they say an airplane is code one, that means it's ready to go. If they say it's code two, that means it's mission ready, but it might need some minor work. Code three means take it back to the shop and overhaul it because it ain't going anywhere until it gets fixed. Well, in the model community, code three references when you take a model and it's in one form and then you do your own work on it to turn it into something else. Uh, this isn't my first Code 3 that I've done on the channel, but this one is kind of unique because it's one that I've actually wanted to do for a long time and just never had the resources or uh, ability with the materials to make it happen until very recently. So, um, yeah, so this is a pretty nice TF-104 rendition in U.S. Air Force colors. Uh, the look I was going for was a TF-104 that would have been stationed over at Luke Air Force Base, and um, it looks pretty darn nice. We'll circle back to where the connection comes in with the West German Luftwaffe in a little bit, but um, to rewind a little bit, the reason I did this is because uh, Hobby Master has not done very many F-104s in U.S. Air Force colors, and that's kind of to be expected because there's only... Um, the U.S. Air Force was actually one of the people that flew the Starfighter the least. Uh, they had, um, of all the countries that flew them, they had one of the lowest inventories. So uh, the F-104 that you see here, the Starfighter, would become one of the most important aircraft to fly in the NATO inventory during the Cold War with the countries of Belgium, Canada, Denmark, West German, Germany, Luftwaffe, I should say, Greece, Italy, Japan, Jordan, the Netherlands, Norway, Pakistan, Spain, Taiwan, and Turkey all flying the aircraft uh, in their air forces. So uh, most of those countries have been represented by Hobby Master's production run of 172nd scale models. So the U.S. Air Force has only had, by my count, about seven. And the last one came out quite some years ago. So as a result, if uh, you go shopping for these on eBay oof, um, you're going to be paying a lot of money to get one of these. So as much as I am a fan of the F-104, I am not a fan of paying $299 something dollars to get one. Um, the, the most affordable U.S. Air Force colors I could find were almost in the $200 range before shipping. So yeah, some other solution was in order. And it came about when I was able to pick up a Turkish Air Force F-104 at a really good price. And then I decided, well, if I take some decals and some model paint and make some things happen on a Friday evening, and voila, here you see the result. So I will let the viewer be the judge of whether I did a good enough job or not. I'm sure you'll tell me in the comments if I did or didn't. So um, that established, let's do a little bit of history here. So with my model reviews, I generally cover a little bit of the aircraft's history just because it's my way of paying homage to the team of people that have engineered the real thing. It should be noted that in any fighter jet, uh, there's a lot more to the story than just the pilots and the navigators and the crew that go fly it. Uh, there's the engineers who work on it. There's the production people who build it. There's the supply people who make sure that the nails and the cabinets and the parts and supply cabinets are all filled and ready. There's the shipping people that make sure all the parts get to where they're supposed to go. And on and on and on it goes all the way to the pilot strapping on the airplane and going flying in it. So um, those people's stories, I think, deserve some discussion and pointing out in the model reviews. So I do that in my channel. And trust me, I will get to reviewing the model in due time. But first, uh, some interesting facts about the F-104 Starfighter's history. Uh, we'll begin with how this project started, which was over the skies of... Uh, North Korea in the 1950s. So during the Korean War, the U.S. Air Force was unpleasantly surprised by the introduction of the Soviet-built MiG-15, which at that time was the most advanced swept-wing jet fighter on the globe. Uh, 
uh, finding this out the hard way over the skies of Korea bred some, shall we say, interesting perspectives from the U.S. pilots who were flying F-80s and F-84s, which were, in, in, uh, in terms of performance, inferior to the MiG-15. Uh, Lockheed engineer Clarence Kelly Johnson, who had already made his name building such famous aircraft such as P-38 Lightning, um, would go on to interview some of these pilots and get their first-hand take at what the next generation of combat fighters needed to be. And with that information in hand, Clarence Johnson and his team at Lockheed and the Skunk Works Department began work on what would be known as the F-104. Uh, after starting in 1951, the prototype was ready by March of 1954, which by modern standards is absolutely blazing. Uh, just to understand uh, that in context, right now the F-35 is going on 20 years and there are aspects of that airplane that are still in testing. So yeah, uh, these folks didn't play around. They went from a piece of paper in 1951 to a flying prototype in 1954 with the first F-104A going into service in 1958. So that is seven years from a piece of paper to an operational on the front lines of a U.S. Air Force squadron aircraft. That, ladies and gentlemen, is extremely fast. <laughs> and that's not even the fastest part of the whole deal because the F-104 would be the first aircraft to travel faster than 1,400 miles an hour, which is a very, very, very quick for a combat fighter jet. Uh, first Mach 2 fighter to ever enter service. And in fact, it's still used now by several civilian organizations and warbird restorers, like the people at Starfighters Incorporated in Florida. They've got some really good YouTube videos. If you want to see some modern high-definition footage of the F-104 in action, uh, a fellow named uh, Pio Carlo Giacci, and I apologize if I'm mangling his name because he's uh, a fairly good pilot uh, going off of his footage, but he does some great walk-arounds and tours of the F-104. So if you want to explore it in much more detail but find reading books a little too uh, old-fashioned, uh, feel free to check out his YouTube videos. Uh, I'll see if I can get a link to them in the description for this video because they are uh, very informative and they show you stuff like uh, how the igniters work and where the DC voltage is on the, the bottom of the, the aircraft here, where the hatches go and what the, the hydraulic doors and all the other really neat little things about the F-104 that you might not pick up easily from, uh, you know, books and printed material. So uh, that's, <laughs> that's how capable this thing is. It's still in flying in service to this day. And um, the last military to fly it was the Italian Air Force who had upgraded theirs with some longer range missiles and better defensive technologies. Uh, those aircraft were retired in 2004. So yeah, from 1954, when the prototype goes out to, uh, you know, 50 years later, that's, it's a very long service life. And like I said, they're still flying today in multiple civilian organizations. So there are a lot of really cool things about the F-104 to call out, but one that I'd like to point some attention to that took me by surprise when I was researching this video is the intakes. So the intakes might seem like a simple part, but in fact, the folks at Lockheed had done something really clever with the F-104. Uh, so with uh, high-speed airplanes like this, generally some means needs to be built into the aircraft to slow down the airflow going in. Um, what happens is when you have a jet aircraft, the air comes into the aircraft in some form, which as you see here would be these intakes there. The air comes into the aircraft through uh, these ports. The air goes into the middle where the engine lives, and then the air is compressed. It is injected with fuel. It is burned through the compressor uh, section here, and then it is put through the afterburner, and then out it comes as a big, huge tongue of flame. And uh, we all see that at the air shows and various things. So the important thing here is some means has to be built in to take the air that's coming into the aircraft and to slow it down because the engine cannot accommodate air and compress air that is moving supersonic. So some means has to be done to slow that down. And most other organizations that build fighter jets like this generally have some contraption or mechanical system in the intake which either has a cone that moves in and out as you see with some of the MiG fighters 
uh, or there is some door system inside. Uh, there are a lot of examples of that. The F4 has uh, an external door that is in front of the intake and opens and closes based on the speed, which slows down the air going in. Uh, the F14 has an internal setup, so you have the intake and then there are doors inside, which slow down the airspeed before it gets to the engine. It's one of the reasons why the TF30 wasn't really a good choice for it, because the TF30 was not designed for that sort of setup. But with the F104, they did something really clever here. Um, what uh, Clarence Johnson, uh, Associate Engineer Ben Rich and his team did, is they made the intakes in a way that they sized it to as it is with no doors or adjustments needed to take the air coming in and to ensure that the proper speed and flow of air is directed into the J79 General Electric engine. Uh, what they did is they put basically two flows into the engine. So there's an outer intake, which you can of course see here. And then on the uh, actual F104, there is a vent door behind here that is, uh, that's just a little scoop and it takes air in and will divert that to a secondary flow. So when the airplane is flying under the speed of sound, you have the big intake, which goes into the engine. The engine sits in kind of this cavity where uh, there's just air surrounding it, and the airflow gets drawn into the engine from both the front and from the sides, because you have little intake doors that are spring-loaded, one there, then one on the bottom, which you can't see from this angle. And then when the engine is flying below the speed of sound, it will draw air from the front and from the sides if need be, if it needs more airflow. Um, then when it goes faster than the speed of sound, about 750-ish miles an hour, the uh, airflow will then be drawn strictly from the front and it will be routed around the engine and out the back. So without needing doors or actuators or valves or some kind of uh, central air data computer based system for moving the spike in and out or any of those types of things, um, the Lockheed Skunk Works team developed an intake that could ensure the optimum amount of air is going into the engine without using uh, any moving parts in the intake to make this happen. It's a very, very ingenious system for something that was designed in 1951. <laughs> okay. That's pretty freaking cutting edge. Uh, just for perspective, the Mach 2 F4 Phantom 2 wouldn't enter service until uh, 1963. So, you know, you're talking about technology to make an airplane go fast uh, almost a decade before the rest of the aerospace industry comfortably caught up. And Lockheed was able to do this uh, with an engineering setup that didn't use any doors, it didn't involve any actuators or computers that required monitoring of the intake flow to move actuators in and out, because all that stuff has weight, right? All that stuff, um, you know, it has to be carried on the airplane and it has a weight to it, which means there's gonna need to be fuel and propulsion and thrust to offset that, and that invokes some kind of a size cost, right? Which is another reason why, as Mach 2 fighters go, the F-104 is pretty small, uh, because the Skunk Works team were very clever in how they packaged and engineered the airplane, and they solved a lot of technical problems with just applied thinking and know-how. Um, interestingly enough, if you look at some of the very early pictures of the F-104 from back in the 50s, you'll find that the intakes have covers on them, have metal covers that fare them over. And the fairings were done to keep this intake design classified because, in fact, it was so groundbreaking for the era that it was considered a state secret and to prevent the Soviets or anyone else from figuring out how the intake system worked uh, there were fairings put over the intakes whenever the F-104 was shown to the public so that <laughs> tells you something about the level of engineering that this airplane has behind it and I was taken uh, by surprise reading that and it's one of the enjoyable things that I love about doing this channel for you folks is that um, yes, of course, by me imparting this, you all hopefully will learn something new, but I learned some, I learned new stuff doing this, uh, researching it and finding new nuggets of information about our favorite aircraft like this. So um, many of the printed sources have information and interviews and recounts from people who uh, don't necessarily connect on the internet that often. So um, 
being able to share this, bring this to you is really, really fulfilling. So uh, hopefully you all got a kick out of that. And um, coming back to the history of the F-104, it would go on to again serve with over, uh, looking at the count here, over 17 Air Forces uh, plus the U.S. Air Force over its 50 year long operational career. Uh, while it did serve in many conflicts, it didn't get very many uh, kills against Soviet aircraft, largely because most of those organizations that flew Soviet aircraft and were going up against the F-104, uh, they did their best to avoid it. <laughs> because an airplane that can go Mach 2 is hard to see and flies really fast is not an adversary you want to go after. So most air forces are run by sensible people. They're not run by Hollywood film directors. Hollywood film directors love dogfights and close-in battles. Um, air Force commanders want their people to come home from a fight. So when the F-104 was in a certain theater, most opposing Air Forces gave direction to the effect of don't mess with it. And it, it's sensible, right? Um, unfortunately, if you're the top boxer in a given uh, category, you're not going to get very much business because nobody wants to fight you because nobody wants to lose. And go figure, that's also the same attitude with wars. So the F-104 didn't get much of an opportunity to shoot down a lot of MiGs, but that is not to say that it wasn't a very effective aircraft in its time. So uh, I'm glad to have it in the mix. It, uh, it actually appears in quite a few media of the time. Uh, if you notice in the intro footage, I've got some clips from the Star Trek episode Tomorrow is Yesterday, which is one of uh, a Star Trek staple, which is time travel. The Starship Enterprise, crewed by the uh, delectable Captain Kirk and his enterprising crew, uh, they end up in a time warp, which seems to be a weekly occurrence in Star Trek, and uh, end up uh, at low altitude in the uh, Earth's atmosphere, flying over U.S. airspace in the Cold War. And remember, the Star Trek originally started in the 1960s during the Cold War. So at that point, the F-104 was the frontline aircraft of the U.S. Air Defense Command. So they had a scene where, of course, a U.S. Air Defense Command F-104 uh, single-seater uh, intercepted the USS Enterprise, which was crippled and, and traveling at relatively low atmosphere for what that starship can do. And there's a sequence where uh, the, the pilot is stopped by a tractor beam and they beam him aboard and they talked about, well, if he has nuclear missiles on board, which um, was trialed, they actually tried to see if they could get a, an AR-2 Genie air-to-air -air nuclear missile on the F-104, but it was never adopted because there was a trapeze system and it was kind of a Rube Goldberg deal to get that on the F-104. So uh, Clarence Johnson's team tested it, but ultimately, based on the advice of Kelly Johnson and, the, and some of the Air Force people, they didn't go with it, but it, it was trialed um, and in any event. So uh, Spock wasn't necessarily completely wrong, but um, they, uh, the Enterprise uh, takes the ship or takes the F-104 and a tractor beam, which destroys the aircraft and they beam the pilot aboard. And of course that launches the plot of the story. So, um, you know, that's uh, something that some people might not be aware of, but the F-104 in its time did star in that show. And it also, of course, was featured in The Right Stuff because the uh, NF-104 low altitude, uh, or excuse me, uh, low space high altitude research aircraft was used to uh, explore and train astronauts in how to navigate low Earth orbit because the F-104 has a very high climb capability and Lockheed built a variant that has a rocket engine in the back of the tail, which would allow it to go over 110,000 feet, which is, you know, low Earth orbit. So um, that's very high and that's the point. It's designed to train people on how to do that. So when they are astronauts, they have some familiarity of how that kind of thing works. So this is, of course, a variant that, um, at the time, uh, Colonel Chuck Yeager flew when he had a mishap in an F-104, lost control, uh, and um, wound up having to eject. So uh, the F-104 featured in that, and that's also one of the ways that people know it. So uh, between those media articles and probably a few other ones that I don't remember offhand, uh, hopefully Hobby Master, the makers of this 172nd scale model, will see fit to introduce a new variant. Uh, I would like to see a new U.S. Air Force release, even if um, it may not necessarily be in these colors. 
um, just because, you know, $200 for a model, come on, folks, that's uh, <laughs> that's a chunk of change, at least maybe for me. Some of y'all, most of y'all out there might be okay with that, but for me, well, let's just say I missed the um, I missed the whole crypto hustle, so here we are. Um, so as a result, uh, I basically made my own here, and again, it's in the colors of a TF-104 that's emulating what you might find at uh, Luke Air Force Base circa 1976 or 1980 or so. Um, bear in mind, of course, that uh, the TF-104 in question in the U.S. Air Force colors actually weren't owned by the U.S. Air Force. I was surprised to note that they were actually owned by the Luftwaffe. So essentially, the Luftwaffe had a training uh, deal with the U.S. Air Force where the Luftwaffe would buy and own the airplanes and the U.S. Air Force would mark and operate them out of Luke Air Force Base in uh, Arizona. And the thought process there was because the airspace in Europe is very congested, uh, there's not a lot of room to work with if you're in high-speed aircraft, the U.S. is a much more suitable area to train pilots in aircraft that can do 1,400 miles an hour because there's actually airspace here to do that. So you do 1,400 miles an hour in Germany, you're going to be in uh, Lithuania or France before you know it. So uh, being able to train to those kind of speeds and altitudes and various dynamic environments and stuff, not have to worry about weather and traffic, mean that it's just more efficient for German pilots to train here. And in fact, I believe they still do so now at the Euronato Joint Pilot Training Organization down at Shepherd. But that's a bit of a digression. So coming back to the point, um, the F-104s were flown out of Luke and again owned by the Luftwaffe, but they had the U.S. Air Force markings that you see here. So uh, interesting bit there that uh, should Hobby Master pick up one of these and, and do another run, it's going to be essentially of a Luftwaffe F-104 that looks like a U.S. Air Force F-104. So uh, kind of an interesting little uh, tidbit there about this particular model and what I'm looking for in terms of the design of it. So otherwise, since we can't really comment on the paint finish or any of that stuff because Hobby Master really didn't make this, I mean, well, obviously they did, but they didn't make the final product. So uh, the mistakes and errors that you see in some of the colors, we really can't lay that at the feet of Hobby Master directly like we normally would with these reviews. So we'll just look at the F-104 in general which um, we'll talk about the canopy system, which I think is kind of creative. Hobby Master did a great job of making the canopy relatively easy to work with. So instead of a complicated or fragile system, they made it so that you had one canopy to show when the aircraft's in flight, like you see here, where there's no seams, you just pop it off and push it in place as you need to. Very simple, no fuss, no muss. And when you want to display it on the ground, they give you, um, five parts that are separate but again they fit into the same spots in the canopy and it's relatively straightforward to put them in you just have to take your time and uh, make sure the fiddly bits line up before you put the canopies in the open position but uh, after that it's pretty smooth sailing it also means that you can put the crew into the uh, model fairly easily you don't have to worry about cutting any of the uh, you know pilots legs off to get them to fit or any of that kind of drama you just uh, open the canopy, put them in, put the canopy back in, and whether it's on the ground or displayed in the air, fairly straightforward. So um, the model and the shape of it and the overall tooling, I think it's one of Hobby Master's best efforts in the 172nd scale space, which is really good because I think this is basically the only quality option you can get off the shelf right now. So bravo to Hobby Master for getting the shape and the details right. I especially like what they did with the engine intakes and how they've modeled that fairly well um, within the confines of a 172nd scale model. Obviously with something like 148 scale, they would have a bit more leeway to show some more detail, but for 172nd scale, it's pretty nice. Um, one word of caution on the landing gear, if you do want to display it with the landing gear up, um, there is no tab on the front landing gear door to easily extract it. So I would recommend that uh, if and when you do decide to pick up one of these uh, TF-104s or F-104s from Hobby Master, that you do put a piece of scotch tape or something to, um, to attach to the end of it, which will make it easier for a pair of tweezers to pull it out. Otherwise, they'll sit flush with the nose and you will not be able to pull it out. So <laughs> just word to the wise, in case you have one or uh, you wanna get one, uh, that'll save you a great deal of hassle and aggravation if you want to switch from the airborne display to the ground display. 
Uh, please don't ask me how I know that. So uh, overall, I think it's a really good tooling. And, um, you know, if you're inclined in doing a, a Code 3, I think it's if you want to do a U.S. Air Force Code 3, it's relatively straightforward. Uh, the problem is you'll have to find a quote-unquote donor F-104 model that is painted in completely natural metal finish. Um, it will have white wings, and these are painted white. <laughs> Another fun tidbit about the F-104, they painted the wings white because they were originally just natural metal, like the fuselage. However, the Lockheed people found that when the aircraft went above the speed of sound, the natural metal of the wings would heat up in the sun and that would cause the ailerons and some of the moving parts in the wing to freeze up because of tolerance issues when the wing got bigger due to heat resistance and friction in the sun. So by painting it white, it is, and it was actually uh, successful in ensuring that the temperature was reduced on those parts, which would prevent uh, problems from tolerances changing because of the aircraft moving at high speed. So interesting little tidbit there but you'll want to find a natural metal finish F-104, which has the white wings on the top and then the air defense gray finish on the bottom. And, um, you know, something from either Turkish Air Force or the Taiwanese Air Force, I think would be good options. And then you'll need to get a 172nd scale, a US Air Force, um, either F-104 decal set or a decal set from an F-102 or an F-106. Uh, those three airplanes are pretty much in the same genre and era, so I think the decals, as long as they're one seven second scale, should cross between them without much of an issue. Um, it also will enable you to get them a little bit better because getting F-104 specific decals is kind of tough. So if you uh, can get one from, say, uh, a Convair F-106, you'll probably have an easier job finding a set of those than you would for an F-104. So... Um, and for the paint, I used a, a chrome for the main fuselage. I think it's a FS17178 off the top of my head. If that's wrong, please correct me in the comment section. Um, I also got the uh, frost white, which is just you know gloss white for the wings, fairly straightforward. Then I got air defense or aircraft gray for the bottom, which you can't see, but that's what you'll use for the bottom wing surfaces uh, if you want to take on this project yourself. And you'll also want some black gray for the tail section, especially the gray that comes around here. Uh, that's going to use a black gray. And then another thing that I did, which I generally do on my F-104 models anyway, is I take the relatively uh, flat, kind of generic gray, plasticky look of the J-79 nozzle on the F-104. I uh, paint the inside black. And then I um, do a layer of, or well, not layer, but I do a coat of Tamiya uh, black panel wash on the outside of the nozzle. Not the outside of the actual titanium shroud. That is That stays the same, but I think the ends, the nozzle here that's inside of the shroud, I paint that with the Tamiya um, black panel wash. And I think it does a really good job of setting off the nozzle making it look a bit more realistic and worn in instead of looking like some uh, plastic switch cover or something really generic. So uh, those are some of the changes that I did. And while they may not be a, a big, big changes, I think it, it really makes the model look pretty nice. So let me know what you all think in the comments of the Code 3 that I did. If you all like it, I'll do some more, uh, put them on the channel and everything. So um, I think showing some of these projects is only beneficial, not just for <laughs> myself and showing what I'm doing, but also for you all out there that might be thinking, gee, you know, I got this, you know, natural metal finish F-104 chilling in my display case and, you know, I, I'd like to turn it into something else, but you're not sure what it's going to look like, you know, and you don't want to spend money and paint and time and, and possibly mess it up or put a theme together that you might not like, right? So uh, hopefully it'll get some some mind sinking and some creative juices flowing for some of you out there that might be thinking about taking on a similar project for your F-104s. So uh, best of luck on those of you that have projects like that. So um, with that, I would recommend that if you are an F-104 fan, that you pick up the Hobby Master variant <laughs> and as quickly as you can, even if it's not necessarily in the US Air Force colors. Uh, the other countries, the other 17 nations, has some pretty cool camouflage. Uh, Belgium has one that's in a tiger finish, which hopefully 
will come through the Santa Claus delivery system. We'll see, it's on my Christmas list. So um, here's to hoping that the loved ones in my life have uh, taken note of that and we'll see where things land in 2024. If I did get that one, uh, I might throw it on a channel. So hopefully that'll be something to show. Um, but back to the point at hand, if you are a fan of this aircraft, I highly recommend that you check out the diverse selection of color schemes. Uh, believe it or not, the German Air Force ones are pretty darn cool looking. Uh, so if you wanna look at the natural metal finish TF-104 and the neon blue bulk, uh, Oswald Bulk F-104 commemorative, those two are some really good options. The Tiger Stripe one that I mentioned from Belgium, that's selling at a pretty decent price and it looks pretty darn cool. So definitely pick that up. And uh, some of the uh, Japanese Air Self-Defense Force ones look pretty nice too. And I'm sure I'm forgetting a few. So take a look. Uh, there's again, 17 countries plus the US. So odds are, uh, if you're an F-104 fan, you'll find something that's up your alley. And if you can't, or if you do, and it costs too much money, like I found out here, uh, you can make it happen yourself. So with that, we will conclude today's review here. Thank you all once again for tuning in and watching this video. If you like this review, I invite you to check out the other ones on my channel and to consider subscribing. That way you'll be notified when I publish a new video. So I'll do videos on just reviews of models from Hobby Master and other companies. I'll also do reviews on weathering and some of the projects and repaint setups like the Code 3 that you see here, as well as the Code 3 I did on an Iranian Tomcat earlier this year. So once again, thank you all for tuning in and watching today's video, and I will catch you all in the next one. Happy travels.